imagine the lives of those people now as they would undoubtedly find it hard to imagine ours but we are not unconnected we have their words their songs their music their art recorded memories even photographs and of course our own imaginations to take us back for a while so come with us to the season's edge <coughs> All amend for the days that are past and gone when the sun of glory bright on the fairest isle of the ocean shone with freedom's holy light when the golden ship on a been fought on the flag of the free, and the king of the green land bowed its head. Oh, the king of the ocean sea, with the Saxon dead to draw his brand, where God he with us now would the Albion dare to lift his hand with a crown on King Olaf's brow but in the sleep of death they lie their glory has passed away and the children of Saxon King obeyed. Oh, where was the blood of the kings of old when Athol's sword is thrown? When a chieftain bartered his rights for gold, was this like God his son? Our Still as bright as fair, its sons are still as free. 
Today. We have certainly got our work cut out for us, but that's why I'm here. When you need change, new blood, you call in the best, and in Henry Locke, you've got the best. Now I think I, you know why we're here today. Tea and biscuits? Well, <laughs> no, Douglas, not tea and biscuits. Anyone else? Uh, the ports, do you know why we're here? Well, I thought there'd be tea and biscuits as well. <laughs> Of course there's going to be tea and biscuits. What's a meeting without them? But that's not why we're here. Why I'm here. <laughs> Ramsay, I wouldn't expect anything less. But can anyone tell me, what are we doing today? The ports. Peel. Meeting? Yes, we're meeting, right? Okay, but why? Castletown. You're weirdly silent. Anything? No. Right, how about you, Douglas? For change? Yes, change! The Isle of Man needs change. The world is moving on. Technology is improving. There's an industrial revolution going on. What are we doing? Fishing? Fishing. 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 <laughs> exactly. Fishing. You're out there with your smacks and luggers, nickies and nobbies. Well, the money pours away. The island is poor. There's no work. People are starving. I mean, 40 years ago, you had a riot over potatoes. <laughs> Who riots over potatoes? The bishop was going to put a tax on them. It was outrage. We had to riot. Um, <laughs> I'd like it to be known that I am not just fishing. I am attempting to govern this sorry lot who don't seem to know what's best for them. <sighs> Thanks for that, Castleton. But seriously, you all really are in a rough state. But it's not your fault. There's no money. People are leaving, abandoning farms that have been in the family for centuries. Generations. Something needs to be done. And I'm the man to do it. I have a vision. And that vision is tourism. <laughs> oh, what now? <laughs> Tourism. There's steamships now. You can get to the island in a matter of hours instead of days. What we need is people to spend money to get here, then spend money to stay here, then spend money while they're here. If we don't have the cash, we need to get the cash to come to us. But, but how? Why would somebody want to make a holiday here? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly! And that is what we're here to discuss. Why come here? What is there to see, to do? How can we turn this island into the most visited location in the British Isles? What have we got? Lexi has a wheel. <laughs> a wheel? Right. Good start. But that's what I'm talking about. Come on, people. Blue sky thinking. We're just spitballing, throwing things out there. No idea is too small. We are staying in this room until we sort out the next few decades. I'm determined. 
that the Isle of Man will become the best holiday destination of our generation with Douglas, our stylish capital, the jewel in the crown. Um, excuse me. Castletown, what do you want? Right. First off all, I am the capital, not Douglas. And second of all, who wants all these people coming here anyway? I think we're doing just fine with our fish and potatoes. Thank you very much. Oh, Castletown, <laughs> shut up. This is why no one wants you to be the capital anyway. You and your little Castletown clique are so 1840s. <laughs> oh, 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 how oh, dare you speak to me like that? Feels right, you know. You think you're all high and mighty filled with your MHKs and your posh people? No one even likes you. <laughs> Are you going to let them speak like that to me? I demand to speak to your manager! Oh, hon. I was appointed by Queen Victoria herself. Do you think she's got the time to give a minute to you? You've had your time. But it's my time now. I've moved on to Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm taking Tinwald with me. Ah, oh, I will. Hey, hey, you keep calm and quiet down. Yeah? The grown ups are talking. <laughs> right, moving on. So, Douglas. Yes, capital. Score, I love that idea. Small problem, though. I hate to bring up personal issues, but we're among friends, right? Well, the thing is, it's my peer. It's kind of small and it's in the wrong place. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Easily sorted. We'll build you a new one. Well, how on earth can we afford that? We've got loads of money. It's just sitting there. The problem is, the British authorities don't trust the island to manage it ourselves. They say they won't give us control because we're not an elected body. They say, how could we accurately reflect the will of the people? This might sound crazy, but why don't we have an elected government? Yeah, I mean, the rumblings have been going on for quite a while. That James Brown fella is in and out of prison in Castle Russian all the time demanding reform. Maybe we could just do it. What? There is absolutely no way I will ever allow the House of Keys to be an elected body. Shut up, Castletown. <laughs> really his last straw. Done. We'll have a general election. Everyone can vote for their officials and we can get our hands on the money we need to build the stuff we need to convince people to come to the island on their holidays. Simple. Sweet. So everyone will be able to vote? Well, most men. <gasps> Maybe some women. <laughs> <laughs> women voting. Ah, oh, this really is the limit. Hang on, hang on, hang on. So Douglas gets to be the capital and it gets a new peer. What about the rest of us? Yeah. Don't worry, Ramsey. Peer for you and a harbour. <laughs> Peel! Build a breakwater. Stick a lighthouse on it. Bam. Poor Erin. Well, actually, we're already building a new breakwater. Make it bigger! We're doing this, people! Well, I think I need to warn you about the storms. Oh, don't we fine. Castletown! No, I do not want tourists! Fine, moving on. <laughs> so, we sorted out how we're going to get them here. But how are they going to get round when they are here? I mean, nothing personal, Peel, but do you think you can really keep people entertained for a whole week? You don't want to talk, Ramsay. What have you got going for you, apart from the stick of fish? Oi! <laughs> nice one, Ports. <laughs> Enough! We've got to find a way to connect and work together. Any thoughts? Boat trips. Long walks. Horses. <laughs> Those new steam train things. Yes, that's it! <gasps> Douglas! <laughs> You're genius! Who can resist a steam train? They're the newest rage. Height of technology. Cutting edge. We'll cover this island in steam trains. <gasps> Let's not stop there. Cable cars. Horse tram. 
dance going up and down the promenade. The promenade? What promenade? I mean, I have got a prom, but it's small. Douglas, will you please stop talking about how small your assets are? <laughs> we'll build you a new prom. Or two. Oh, it would be magnificent. Be lined with hotels and boarding houses, and people can stroll your wide streets and shop and chat. How about that? Oh, well, what are you going to tell me now? Your streets are too small. Well, yes, my streets are small. They're tiny and filthy, but that's not what I was going to say. Spit it out then. Well, you see, about these new hotels, I don't exactly have what you might call running water or a sewer system. <laughs> ah. Well, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll build them. And in the meantime, who needs them? A hotel of 50 people needs, what, two communal bathrooms? <laughs> that ought to do it. Oh, and in the meantime, we can convince people that staying in tents is fun. Tents? <laughs> we'll call it a holiday camp or something. They'll love it. Oh, this is so ridiculous. I, I can't believe you'd all stoop so low. I mean, I would never allow such oh things. Oh, my. Castletown, we know. Right, people, keep it coming. What have we got? Let's talk sightseeing. Well, I've got this big swampy area. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me more? I thought I could turn it into a pleasure park. Oh. You know, boating lakes and bowling greens and entertainment and stuff. Do it! <laughs> People like church. Yeah. My cathedral is falling down. We could fix it into something fancy. That old thing! No. Build a new church. The bigger the better. Stained glass steeple, the works. How about all those rivers that run down to the sea everywhere? The glens. We could make lovely paths alongside them and put turnstiles at the top and charge people for getting in. <laughs> do it! Oh, oh, and someone would do that for extra stuff, like tea houses and sea lions and polar bears and little trains and caves and oyster pools and vernaculars. Oh! No, you're talking! Come on, hit me with some more. Castle Down's got a castle. Oh, uh, what? Well, don't, don't bring me into it. A great castle. One of the best. Well, second only to mine, of course. We could charge people to go round it. Look around my castle? Do I need to remind you that my castle is a prison? Who cares? We still execute people there? Oh, the more macabre, the love it! <laughs> right, Can more. Can we Yes! Castles. Yes! We'll have the largest dance floor in all of Europe. Theatres. Yes! How about those ancient stones and mounds that they've been digging up lately? Really cool. What? <laughs> well, no. But we Ori. could give them we could give them names like King Ori's grave and make up stories about what they are. <laughs> the sky's the limit. We can have chairs that grant you wishes and rocks in the shape of magical footprints. Anything. Genius! I love it! Oh, do it! Mates, I'm so excited. This is gonna be so great. The Isle of Man's going to be the best it's ever been. <coughs> There's going to be so many jobs, and everyone can play a part in it if they want. Yeah, taking away people from the fields and the hills. Well, who's, who's going to be left to carry on the farming or the mine and every other industry? It'll just disappear. Shut up, Castletown. <laughs> <laughs> All of these new ideas will be a great opportunity for any businessman who wants to make their fortune. Yeah, English businessmen with the resources to outcompete the Manx. The streets will be packed with people coming to spend their money on our fair island. <laughs> yeah, thieves and ruffians want to take the money away. Shut up, Castle Town. <laughs> and the Manx people could chat with all the visitors and tell them what a great nation we are. Yes, in English. And who will be speaking Manx if everyone's serving the English? You think the language and traditions will survive? Shut up, Castle Town. Everyone will know that the Isle of Man is the destination of choice. Until something better comes along and people stop coming. And then what will we have left? Sure. Oh, we are on the edge of greatness, everyone. I can feel it. This is the moment in time when everything changes. 
We are done with the slow and quiet times of the past. We're done with the struggle and the poverty. If we unite and push forward, we can usher in the most glorious era the Isle of Man has ever seen. I'm ready to lead you there. Who's with me? I'm in. Army. I'm in. And us. Castletown? Ah, fine, maybe. Just a little bit. Good enough for me. Come on, everyone. We're doing this. children. But I keep my treasure very deep, and though the years may come and the years may go, I will keep it there forever. language, 
he would see how it could be spun into more. But whether through magic or the machinations of politics and dodgy dealings, who knows? Now, these ones, they can give you a tale of spinning and magic. Mind you, it's still in Manx, so I'm doubting there's much future for those fellas at all. <laughs> <laughs> countryside and the way it was a, a pick of years ago. Did you ever get to bribe at all at the harvest time? The Melia bot? The wee tickle shed? Oh, Tammy Tickle. Well, I never set bride, sight on bride at all before. Well, this uh, this will put you in mind of times gone by. Some extracts from me famous poem, the Melia bot. Oh, well, this could take some time. Better be sitting down. <laughs> Just 30 torrents in the haggot we've got. Of oats and barley and wheat. Uh, there was a slew out and a bit to cook. The harvest was rather late. Well, then, the melia was took to do. Is a show. Though the fun was them days gone. We worked that day till half past three instead of dinner from twelve to one. We had started at seven that morning bright. The women and girls was a treat to see with their heavy wash prints on the stocking so tight. Of myself, I was full of glee. <laughs> with bright hooked sickles and ox to place down, them rail old sunbonnets, bless their hearts. Along the dewy hedges, their way they traced through the fine, the freshness, the finest art. Now then, says Jem, as the field we reach, that field uh, was far Jem Max. Nan and me to the foray, you brats to teach, to follow behind in our tracks. Put pits on the gap, and if he can't keep up, let him go with the gals to make band, and if he can't do that, let him help to stoop, where he'll get a few thistles in his hands. And as true as I'm here, if he doesn't look out and work a sickle like a man at the million, he'll get the dirty get out 
I and care what he might say. Then up to Jim waddled spare the pits, and he swung a sickle right round his head. He swore till it all flew, flew out in spits. He any day work on Jim with the dead. Keep ya cool, ya winter cool, ya porridge wisp, picks ya bark. You could do with Bill Boyd's bellows for such. It's a pity you'll not want to cool your jaw. Then, uh, tonight, you wouldn't get too much. Then, Jem made us back a little more bent. It was bent nearly plenty to start. Uh, the sickle made a grin and a grunt as it went through handfuls of corn at the back. The ring of the sickle in the rustling corn was all you heard now far and wide, like close-lined infantry in the act of storm. They fell their thousands on every side to name these warriors with crooked swords to score the words short too is more than time or paper affords. Besides, we've a merrier in view. <laughs>
as the brute Save your fifty shilling suit And to the flappers give such killing glances It gives you grief and pain Just when the sorrow rain Plays ring a ring a roses with your fancies The Isle of Man, the Isle of Man That's the place to spend your holiday And I love this place, and it has brought out the poetry in me. And I've written some words that I think you may know well. They become famous after my passing in 1866. They made it into the Manx National Assembly. Almost the Manx National Anthem, some say. So now I invite you all, the choir, the players, and you, the audience, to join in that great man's favourite <laughs>
Now when arrived the 11th of May, as I have heard old Manxman say, each horse was snugly stalled, and cows from off the grassy plain, ere Sol had kissed the western main, were promptly homeward called. Hmm. Few horses and cows round here anymore. Swains and homely glee. Fiendish ire. Well, you're hardly Mr. Tennyson, I'm afraid, Mr. William Kennish. <laughs> and though Maytime and Mathold may once have had its charms, not to mention its witches, I'd rather look out of the window to see what May Eve 1866 in Douglas brings. Lights flickering out in the heavens. Bonfires. So many bonfires. Who would have thought it after all these years? It's nearly May already. The months and years crowd in so thick upon one another. May Eve, May Day. These strange and lovely things are coming from another world to me. Another place. The lights look so pretty flickering out there on the hill. The shape and the shadows of the smoke drifting and rising and falling. If I could see further, perhaps I would see furtive figures up there in the headland, up there in the skyline, leaping over small flames to put an end to the winter. And maybe doing other things it's best not to think just yet. Best to <laughs> them out of sight. <laughs> Goodness, Kate Corrin, what are you thinking of? You are a respectable married woman. There'll be ones making a fuss tomorrow. There always are. There's such a good view from this house. You love the sea from the top of the wood. Soon there'll be far more houses pushing up all around us. Tall houses. Nicely appointed, so says Paul, as he should know. But will I still see the far hills with the night clouds flocking to rest ragged on the top? Maybe. From up the top of the house, Alice's room perhaps. The whole island is changing. It must. And his <coughs> eye must too. Perhaps I should start by not talking to myself. <laughs> my bad habit, so my husband says. Who else is going to talk to? Alice! Alice! Where is the wretched girl? The point of a point service in this house is beyond me. Yes, I'll be right with you, Mr. Corrin. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there you are at last. Look, I told you to shut those windows, all of them, and the upstairs, and keep them shut. Oh, this infernal smoke. What's the matter with everyone? It's not as if we're not sitting up here with that appalling stink from the quayside building up 365 days a year. But now the fools are lighting fires just about everywhere. As though it's going to be cold. Cold. Cold and nearly May. Ridiculous. Thank you for doing that, Alice. The smoke is disturbing to Mr. Corrin and myself. Yes, it is. And keep the windows shut. That's not a problem, Mrs. Corrin. I'm not so fond of the old smoke myself. I'll be right off to uh, look at those bedrooms for you. Yes, thank you, Alice. Where are they, Kate? They're not where I left them. What is it you've lost, Paul? The plans for the new terrace, of course. I was only explaining them to you yesterday. And they're not lost. Somebody has removed them. It will either be you or Alice. I hardly think Mrs. Cray would ever venture forth from her kitchen. Yes, I remember. I'm sorry, Paul. Perhaps I moved them to the bureau for safety. Alice is going to dust. These are they, are they not? Yes, they are. And please leave my work alone in future. If I'd wanted you to take on the role of assistant maid servant in this house, I'd have employed you as such. But you are not. You are my wife. And I need you to... Well... 
think of it anymore. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry, I'm being hard. But this is our future, you understand? Our future, our prosperity. Indulge me. Look. Here's where the so-called boarding school for young ladies is, here on the court. And that's where we'll have to go, in poor repair. But this land behind is what I have my sights on. I think we can safely say that Robertson will sell if the price is right. But there will be some work to persuade him. Excuse me, ma'am, but will I be showing the visitors in now? Visitors? At this hour? Are we expecting anyone? Ah, oh, yes, of course, I remember. Um, yes, make haste, fellas, show them in. <coughs> oh, excuse me, the smoke seems to seek you out. I have quite the cough now. <coughs> Go on, girl, bring them in. <coughs> Who is to disturb our peace this evening, Kate? Remind me. It's a Mr. and Mrs. Ella Stevenson, Paul. The husband is a distant business acquaintance of yours, I believe. The visit is apparently urgent, hence the late hour. Stevenson? Let me think. Ah, uh, yes, the timber merchant. Odd chap. Said to have an unusually forthright wife. He has his sights set on a nice little plot up Glen Crutchery way. A pleasant development. Contacts, Kate. We will cultivate them. We must be particularly charming, my dear. Of course. Mr. and Mrs. Stephen Ellison. Oh, Ellis Stevenson. Ellis Stevenson. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Stevenson, please do come in. Pardon me, ma'am. I seem to have got your name muddled. Don't concern yourself, young woman. You wouldn't be the first. <laughs> yes, do come in. And please accept my sincere apologies for the tardiness of our maid. She's from the country, you know. Salty way. Yeah. <laughs> Quite so, yes. Salty. Very distant. Um, Ellis Stevenson. And Mrs. Ellis Stevenson, as I believe he's now established. How do you do? Pleased to make your acquaintance. And we're pleased to meet you both. Delighted, I'm sure, on all accounts. Now, let's not beat about the bush. We come here on a mission. Isn't that right, Mr. Stevenson? Yes, I, I believe so. Is that right? Well, we are intrigued. Please, you must sit down and take tea with us. Oh, or perhaps something stronger. I will not take tea. An addictive substance. I prefer to keep myself clear and focused. As does Mr. Stevenson, of course. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, thank you, old chap. Yes, of course, if you wish. <clears throat> Excuse me, the uh, weather seems to have taken a turn for the worse. Well, <coughs> you know as well as I do that this is not weather. This is smoke. This is burning. I see. This is devilry, <coughs> which is precisely my point. Go slow, dear. I will not be silenced, Mr. Stevenson. The matter before us is an urgent one, as Mr. Corrin has just reminded us. I trust you are recovered. <coughs> yes, I'm fine, thank you. Good show, <coughs> good show. Never go anywhere without a pocket handkerchief, that's what I say. Mrs. Curry, my dear, I don't believe we've met, but I have been informed of your most excellent demeanour and charity towards the less fortunate and foolish of our society. Thank you, you are too generous. Oh, not at all. And you, Mr. Corrin, are most well regarded an up-and-coming citizen of our little town. A man of vision, I am told. <laughs> you flatter me. But yes, I have my connections. Yes, I, uh, I do have, well, visions for this town, if you like. A new town for new times. Then we have common interests, Mr. Corrin. You may not be aware, but I am a writer of some influence. Really? Oh, Mrs. Stevenson, if I might ask, what do you write? Perhaps some poetry? Poetry is lies! I write the truth of what I see. So naturally, as a member of the weaker sex, I must hide myself behind a nom de plume. Fascinating. Do tell. Mm, she will. 
<laughs> to you alone, I will reveal that I am none other than very concerned of Upper Douglas. <laughs> that most regular correspondent to the Mona's Herald. Ah, I see I have you there. Ah, yes, the radical rag. Yes, I must admit you do have me there. We uh, progressives must remain incognito, eh? Oh, I have read your most regular correspondence with an eagle eye. Though I had no idea that your wife, Mr. Stevenson, was the power behind that particular pen. Oh, oh she certainly had a way with words, eh? <laughs> and Mr. Corrin, I believe you to be the very gentleman writing under the name An Observer, am I correct? Yes, you are. You found me out. The Times and the Herald, uh, foot in both camps. Might I say, I found your proposals to move the outdoor markets indoors most intriguing. <laughs> Thank you. I wish more thought so. The people of this town are incredibly reluctant to modernise. I mean, they're perfectly good hall, purpose built. Oh, I had a hand in the design myself. But no, there they all are, out in all weathers, filth, dirt. One might almost think they like it there. Quite. <laughs> Meanwhile, disease is rife, alcohol fuels fists, and children run around wild and ignorant of the Lord. You yourself, as a gentleman of the building profession, can hardly remain indifferent to the living conditions of the feckless and profane, living not two streets from this very house. I've seen such vice in America, and now I see it here. So, uh, how might my dear wife and I be of assistance, Mrs. Stevenson? In a word, we fight. Myself and a few of the more concerned citizens, fearful for the morality of this town, are readying for battle. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. Battle? <laughs> <laughs> desperate times, Mr. Corrin, desperate times. Why, tonight, this very night, young men and women of the lower sort are taking to the hills, unchaperoned, for the so-called burning out of witches. Some sort of mass license for misbehavior. It is wrong-headed, morally dangerous, and contrary to scripture. A superstitious rite, redolent of the dark and diabolical worship of the Druids. We claim to be a God-fearing nation, Mr. Corrin. This must be stopped. I share your concerns. Uh, such behaviours hardly attract a better class of person to come and live amongst us. But I must confess I'm at a loss as to how one might proceed. Really, I, I think such things are best left to those of the clerical persuasion. Oh, do excuse me, boy. Bill sticks. There are many who are too fearful to fight this battle, but I am not. True leadership is what is required. And if man is not to be trusted, it is to the women we must look. What say you, Mrs. Collins? Well, certainly there are So, are we mere gentlemen to be excused, then? I'll leave you ladies to your most pressing debate. Quite so, quite Mr. So. Stevenson and I may have one or two practical business concerns of mutual interest. <laughs> Sit down, Alice, do! Paul, I really do think you should stay if Mrs. Stevenson has such an important message to convey. Important? Certainly! Mr. Collin, have you ever considered how few of the lower classes can actually read your worthy disputations in the local newspaper? Neither can they read my poor efforts. But they have ears, and may be roused to rationality and true religion yet. Education is all. But who is to be the educator? That is the thing. Mr. Stevenson, is that not the thing? The thing? Yes, education. <laughs> That's the thing. Me and my committee have set a meeting for the reformation of the moral character of the Manx peasantry and the abolition of superstitious practices. What do you think of the title, Mrs. Corrin? Really covers the issues in a nutshell, I think. <laughs> I think people will understand to what you refer. Yes, so when do we look forward to this meeting? A public one, I presume. The inaugural meeting will be a week on Tuesday at the Wellington Hall. Room for several hundred standing. I myself will be addressing it, naturally. But I look for your support, Mr. Corrin. You have a Manx name. You may have some influence among your workforce. 
connections. And of course, as a matter of financing the campaign, I trust you'll be more than happy to help us along in that direction. And you, Mrs. Crawley, I do hope you'll consider joining us. I will consider what you say, and thank you. Alice will show you out. Thank you. I'll leave you some information, and me and my committee look forward to hearing from you soon. The information, please, Mr. Stevenson. <laughs> yes, in briefcase. Yes, yes. <laughs> Not really, Alice. Pleasant evening to you. Read and take note. Thank you. And I bid you both good night. <laughs> Pleasant evening. <laughs> Tender old chap, don't you? She's after money, of course. Why can't old Stevenson keep her quiet? She's no backbone. She certainly is a most unusual lady to be addressing company like that. Brave, I suppose, although no care for how she may be regarded. Mm. You would never do that, would you, Kay? Stand up and say what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness. You see, the way you are, Kay, as my wife, I mean, what you are. It governs how I'm perceived by society. Uh, how we are perceived. Families, reputation, they matter, Kay. You could have married better, Kay. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but damn it, Kay, it was you I wanted. I mean, your family is well regarded here. Not wealthy, admittedly, but of long standing, respected. As you know, my own father made a good name for himself in Liverpool over the years. I always intended to follow in his footsteps, but back here, on his native soil, with, with you by my side. Rational, reasonable, forward-looking. All I ask is that you follow those same paths with me, Kate. I'm not always convinced we share that particular vision. I have never opposed you in what you do. And I would never make a show of you four. You know that. No. You are loyal and... I'm irritable this evening. Ignore me. Let's see what our writer of some influence has to say. <laughs> Fires of Baal. What the heck? Where do these people come from? Do you know, Kate, it's hard to imagine that idiot Stevenson is running a successful import business. But he is. Useful contact to the bank, obviously. That's what our wife is. Complete harem. And worse, a religious enthusiast. Oh, when these people get God, they've always got to shout about it. <laughs> Leave muscular Christianity to those of us with muscle, I say. Still, I may consider a donation. Depends who else is backing her. If I do support them, I trust that fool Stevenson will remember me for it. I trust he will. Now, I must resume the embroidery and consider how to make a prior engagement a week on Tuesday. Yes, you do that, Kate. Clever girl. <laughs> What's this? Crosses tied to the tails of cows. <laughs> ridiculous. It is ridiculous, Kate. Tell me you think it's ridiculous, please. Well, maybe, but surely harmless enough. For you, maybe. I dare say... You know more about these things having been brought up on this island. <clears throat> Maybe, I won't ask, you once indulged in a little bit of this primrose magic yourself. But you do not understand the modern world, Kate. You read too much poetry. You must ensure it does not cloud your judgment. Primrose magic. That sounds lovely, Paul. <laughs> yes, yellow flowers to keep away the fairies. We all thought that would help. Your family too, I expect, before they left for England. Yes, harmless enough. Well, don't get any ideas. <laughs> I do not want rotting weeds strewn on our doorstep, nor bitter branch up there gathering cobwebs. And tell Alice, in case she imagines I've gone blind in my old age, no primroses, no mess, no criss, cross... Cross cr ferns? Yes, those. <laughs> this is a ridiculous conversation. I have a letter to write to the bank. We will talk later.
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and all good thinking people of Douglas, I thank you for your appearance at this meeting here tonight. I will not sit down. The gentlemen will have their turn, as I was saying. Thank you for your attendance here tonight. It is so gratifying to see so many. Perhaps there might be some more space down the back. Get down the business. Why are we here tonight? Well, the presence of so many respectable gentlemen of the cloth on the platform here behind me, as well as so many members of our enlightened business community, will give you some indication of the importance of tonight's meeting, the purpose of which is, ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of which is, ladies and gentlemen, for the launch of a new movement the reformation of the moral character of the Manx peasantry and the abolition of the superstitious practices of the RMC and PASP, in short. <laughs> Consider, we live in times of great uncertainty, change. We must hold fast to all that we know is good. But not all that we know is good. Not all that we know comes from God. We are all too aware that on this island, paganism is rife. That same unlettered countryman that bows his head before the Lord on Sunday will cower before the evil eye on Monday. You all know of what I speak. Not two weeks previously, on the very eve of May, we all witnessed the spectacle of the hills near our very homes rising up in flames high enough to threaten the very heavens themselves. Our ears were sorely pained by the devilish cries of primitive instruments, horns, drums, a very cacophony. Are these the actions of a civilized race? I say they are not. I have worse news for you, ladies and gentlemen. Barely credible, I concede in this day and age. But we have received reports from the heart of distant Andreas, <laughs> of individuals engaged in horrible animal sacrifice. Animal sacrifice? To what? To whom? Are we the savages of Borneo? No. I no. say we are not. And the time has come to take our place as good responsible Christian citizens on this small outpost of the British Empire. Join us, and by the sweat of our brows, we will wipe superstition from the land. Let the battle commence. God save the Queen! God save the Queen! Is there anything else you require me to do, Mrs. Collins? No, I don't think so. Thank you, Alice. Mr. Corrin is attending his campaign meeting tonight. He may be late. Sit down, Alice. Take a rest. You must be worn out. <coughs> Thank you, ma'am. You never stop. You must be worn out. Well, a great house like this doesn't claim itself, ma'am. Mr. Corrin is always very particular. He is indeed. Mr. Corrin likes to keep a well-run house. It could not be done without you, Alice, and Mrs. Crane, of course. Thank you, ma'am. I hope the work is to the satisfaction of the both of you. Yes, very much. Thank you. But, well, life cannot, should not be all work. True, but perhaps I shouldn't say. Many of us have no choice, ma'am. Of course. I like your honesty, Alice. 
although I should really inform you that Mr. Corrin does sometimes find it a trifle impertinent. I told him it's because you're young, but you really ought to make care with maintaining the boundaries. Boundaries, is it? Well, I'm sorry to be impertinent. No offence to yourself or Mr. Corrin intended. Perhaps I should return to the kitchen now. Oh, no. Please don't do that. I'd rather you stay here. The house is quiet without my husband, and Mrs. Crane has gone home. As you wish, ma'am. Do you read, Alice? No, ma'am. Well, not much. Can you read? <coughs> what I need to, ma'am. Oh. Can be very freeing, you know, reading. I dare say. It helps you think of things. Get ideas, plans, imagine things, maybe even find out who you really are. I know exactly who I am. Alice Corlett, 20 years of age, native of the village of Sulby, maid servant. That's all. You're more than that, surely. You must have ideas and dreams and plans. Even when you're at work, your mind can be somewhere else, surely. For example, I don't know, when scribbling the scullery or... Well, what do you think of when you carry the coal upstairs? Well, if you want the truth, ma'am, I'm thinking I'd rather not be carrying it up at all. <laughs> it's awful heavy, and it's a great big lump of a bucket, and there's a hole on the way, and the coal dust gets just about everywhere. And I am not thankful for that great big cuss of a fellow who invented the staircase. <laughs> Sorry, that was foolish of me to say. Perhaps one day... And where I come from, there's not many staircases at all, and not much in the way of rooms either. I'm sure this house would have seemed very different to you in the first place. It was. I was looking for all the people that might be living here, and all I found was the two of you. Our Mary's one is nigh to two rooms in Barrett Street, well, then I'm really glad you are here, Alice. Honestly, I am. And if I might be so bold and not myself impertinent, might I ask, are you still walking out with that young man, Alfie? Mm. Or I am not, Mrs. Corrin. True, we were going strong, but he could not say hey nor haw for himself, so I'm set on something better. I'm sorry. Oh, don't be, Mrs. Corrin. He wasn't up to much. <laughs> Awful lumpy and a significant mother at him. Besides, <laughs> I'm seeing someone different on Sunday. Oh, quick work. I hope that works out for you, Alice. A nice husband in time, maybe? Oh, no. Fred you, ma'am. Yes. Time enough. Indeed. A chance to start again now summer's here. Oh, I wonder, did you hear the news? One of those fires a week or two ago on May Eve got out of hand. Up at Callow's place. The papers are full of it. I heard there was a bit of a muster up there. They were saying the owl fella got his breeches near burnt off him <coughs> and his backside hanging out. And he was huffing and cursing fit to wake the dead. And it was him who started the fire anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt those particular newspaper details made it into the newspaper somehow. People like to exaggerate. I wonder what it's all about, though, really. All this burning. I don't know at all. Clearing the ground? Starting again? Pardon me, ma'am, but I'm thinking. With all this burning and firing and all, people need to stay clean and clear the place out from time to time. Like me and me spring cleaning, <laughs> or Mr. Corrin and his grand new developments. They all start with clearing the land till the next time. I suppose there's not much difference. That's very profound of you, Alice. Although I hope Mr. Corrin's legacy lasts a long time yet. As I see it, the summer, and there's winter. And well, they just keep coming back, the same old pattern. And you can't 
out of one without the other? Probably not. You're too young to remember this, but I would remember when I was very small, seeing the fight between summer and winter. Although it wasn't really a fight, it was a sort of procession. Yes, my mother said it was a grand big thing down in Castletown, Maiden. Even the quality was in. Oh, and there was a big fella, the Earl of Deemster, and he was doffing his hat at the Queen terrible serious. More made of him being Queen herself. I remember when I was very small, I always wanted to be part of the mace board. I always hoped I'd be picked to be one of the little girls dressed up with fancy flowers following the Queen of May. I always hoped I'd get a pretty ribbon as such. But no. And I remember there on the other side was old winter, all drab as you like. Summer won the battle, of course. And so she should, till winter comes grabbing at her toes, tripping her up. And whose side would you be on, Alice? Winter or summer? Summer, of course, with all them pretty dresses at her most like. Winter's not all bad, though. Stories round the fire. The look of a clear, a clear day with the hills just after snow. The rumble in your stomach when there's not much to fill it. True. I do remember those days, Alice. A little. From earlier. Things have turned out very differently for us. Chance, I suppose. But there are things from the old life that I miss. The way of talking easy, perhaps. It's difficult talking easy, ma'am between ourselves. Inappropriate, most have said. Mr. Corrin would certainly say so. Well, he's not here tonight, is he? <laughs> no, he's out, fighting for our future. I feel left behind sometimes, Alice. You know it can be lonely in my position too. Time goes on, nothing much changes for me. Nothing changes? How can you be saying that, living in this lovely big house and all time for doing, well, whatever you fancy? Oh, pardon me, ma'am. That's unfair, Alice. I'm sorry, ma'am, ma'am, I spoke out of turn. Yes, you did. Even so, what I meant to say was, well, when I married, I became someone else. And that was it. Need it be like that, though? I wouldn't know, of course, but that Mrs. Stevenson woman, I'm sure she didn't change one little bit when she got married, unfortunately. Her husband might have, though. <laughs> but in a way, I admire her. She has spirit. She doesn't let things rest. Aye, she's got go, all right. There's ones in like that. And then there's ones who are just sitting where the good Lord put them, not shifting, like me grandmother. Nothing changes for that one. Well, not in her head, though her legs aren't as big as they were. Never been out of Solby, and not for starting now. There are a few like that still. She'd be saying, what are people doing, going changing things for? Tonight is the rail May Eve, she's telling me. She's not one for people changing the calendar, telling you what to do and when to do it. Same as the Christmas. She'll be seeing that in January till her dying day. Goodness, so tonight is the real May Eve? Well, that's what my grandmother is saying. She'd be out up on them mountains herself if she wasn't so gone in the age, looking for divilment most like. But she'd take care that she wasn't took for some witch herself, though. Indeed she would. So, if she's right about dates, then tonight, the 11th of May, is the true May Eve. So, tomorrow is the true May Day. Well, then you're surely still in some sort of in-between time that's neither one thing or the other. Strange. Dangerous. 
it's almost like you're crossing the river between two parishes and you don't yet know which side you're on. I suppose so, especially if you fall in. <laughs> of course, I'm not really talking about the river, but rather the space between the two, like the banks, the space between the two. Pardon me, ma'am, but I'm not really understanding what you're saying. Poor Mr. Corrin says that to me often. But just think, Alice, if there were a time where one may say what one likes, do what one likes, even be what one likes, surely you would embrace it? You'd be free to choose. You could be summer or winter. Old or young? God or the devil? Servant or missus? A man or a woman? A man? I wonder what it's like to be someone else. Ma'am? I am Winter's champion. I challenge you to a fight. Do you accept? I do. <laughs> but I don't think Mr. Corrin's going to be too keen of you using his stick. Choose your weapon, Alice. You're young and summer's champion. On guard. Ma'am? <laughs> Take that, madame. I will not, sir, then do your worst. I will. Halt. This will not do. The sides are too well matched. Here, give me your stick. I declare a tug of war instead. Pull, pull. There we are, perfectly matched, as strong as one another. I am winter. I will not let you in. I, you must. I am summer. Let the summer in! Oh! 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 She banny me! There's an awful Gerud in here! Oh, me, me mother would say, it's making a show of ourselves. Mine too, I do not know what came over me. The ass. Oh, oh. Here, let me put that hat back. There's no deal done on that there. It's, it's all right, ma'am. Just Emma Jack, English lit. Did you ever really get to wear a pretty dress and go round with the lace ball? Is that what you're calling it? Heavens no, I was too young. I was just watching, just once. My mother held me up on her shoulders. I was just so happy. It didn't feel wicked at all. It was just like a play, it was. A true play. Kate? Kate, are you in here? Where's Alice? I'll be away off now, Mrs. Curran. Thank you for our uh, play. I'll not say anything. You can trust me on that one. Till next year then, on the in-between times. Oh, that Stevenson woman is insufferable. But annoying as she's right in a way. If she'd only directed jabbering energies to the real issue of this town, then we could be up there with Ipswich or somewhere. <laughs> oh, there's the hat I was looking for. I picked the other one. Good. I'm glad. But was Mrs. Stevenson the only speaker? <laughs> Certainly not. Though probably the loudest. Actually, there were some quite sensible chaps there, too. If you leave religion out of it. Old Stevenson, too. I mean, he can speak, by the way. We were talking afterwards. We must build, you know, Kate. A model of urban development we'd be. No more stinking slums. No more grasping natives. Fewer lawyers, less crime. And proper English, too, you'd hear that spoken. You know, Kate, outside this town, a third of the population, one third cannot speak English properly. Well, of course you may. You could probably jabber along with the rest of them with their butcherings and baldings. And I have had it up to here with fairies and witches this evening. And as for sacrifices, biblical or otherwise, I've had my fill. No. 
I live in the real world. No more public meetings for me. I went, she has a donation, I consider my civic duty done. You certainly had a long evening. You look tired, dear. Did she make you stand on stage? <laughs> no. My piety is obviously suspect. <laughs> you did have the Reverend so-and-so and Minister such and such with their platitudes and warnings. We're all going off in the next big flame, apparently. Unless we repent. I suspect we'll all go up in flames next May Eve anyway, unless the fire service improves. Surely not. Oh, yes. We're all for it, according to our dissenting brethren. They are much the worst. The Methodists? Oh, yes, absolutely the worst sort. Are you laughing at me, Kate? I never know whether you are or not. <laughs> laughing at you? Of course not. There are no dissenters lurking behind the curtain, see? And no witches last time I checked as well. You see, our fire has died down nice and fast. You had a busy evening. Are you not going to ask me about mine? Why? You were reading, surely, as usual. Anything untoward in the annals of Fairyland? No. Just a short conversation with Alice. Yes, well, I have these figures to reconcile before I go to bed. I shall probably be up half the night, so don't wait up. Somebody has to bring the money and think straight. <coughs> Sorry, this cough is still troublesome. <coughs> My cups of whiskey might do the trick. Very well. Good night, dear. Good night, Kate. It's been more than a year now, almost two. It's a pity he's not here to walk up the road and see how his square is developing, how his dreams for Douglas are slowly coming to pass. Palings, railings, neat little gardens, though there's not much growing in them yet. He saw the way that the world was changing. <coughs> And had the sense to change with it, too, I suppose. Not that it did him good. Well, he's gone. And I'm still left with these wretched books and ledgers. No more poetry books for me. My financial situation is apparently somewhat precarious. I'll have to let Alice go. There's a position at the Cowley household, I believe. Oh, I'll miss her. Excuse me a minute. You're still here. I thought you'd be away from the hills with the young people, leaping over small fires to put an end to the winter, sounding the horns. Come and look at the flames. Just sit down. Not me now, Mrs. Collins. Yes. 
they are beautiful. But I'm thinking of all them little creatures that are homeless, or maybe worse. Oh, Alice, I hope you don't think... Oh, no, no, Mrs Corrie. I didn't mean that at all. It can't be helped. And you've been so kind to me. I'm, I'm glad you're trying to find me a new position. But how will you manage? I'll manage somehow, Alice, thank you. The house will be sold, of course. I wondered, would it? I, I had a moment to myself when I was walking to the baker's and I passed a lovely patch of plum roses. So I picked them and brought them back here. Thought they'd look well in a jug. I put them over on the table there. As it being nearly May and all, I, I hope you don't mind. Oh, of course not. Thank you, Alice. Every house should have primroses and lots of flowers, spring flowers, summer flowers. And yes, I think we ought to get some crushed kern about the place as well. I do not feel right without knowing it's here somehow. Is it too late, do you think? Ah, oh, no, it's never too late. Here, have a look in my basket. I've got some kern and I've got some wool from Kayleigh's field. Here, you know what you're doing. I can help you. Yes, I do know what to do. I'm a balaf girl, although I'm a long time out of practice. <laughs> if that Ellison woman could see us now. Stevenson. Oh, that one. <laughs> it's good she can't. She doesn't know the half of it. Bit clicky, if you ask me. Always was. Always will be. No wonder her husband turned to the drink. Well, that's what the student's saying. A poor woman. Bold, though. Perhaps the world is changing. It is that. It may be different to what you, me, or anyone else at all is thinking. Here, help me with this. Do you remember the time we were talking about the Queen of the May? And you were saying how you'd sat on your mother's shoulders and watched the procession going by and wanted to be part of it. I do remember. I can't imagine being that young now. Perhaps, Alice, one day you'll have your own little girl to bring into the world and you can show her wonders. We were never so fortunate as to have children ourselves. I'm sorry about that, Mrs Corrie. And I'm sorry about Mr. Curry too. I hope I do have children, God willing. But I'm waiting first on a decent offer. <laughs> Though I've got somebody in mind. Ooh, tall, dark and handsome? No, short, stout and a great big boil at the end of his nose. He <laughs> has not. <laughs> kind? Yes. And no trouble at all. Quiet in his ways. Our Dan will just do thee fine. Oh, but Mrs. Curry, you're so young. You're still young. You've still got time. It's me. Get the look in. Start again. They'll be queuing up on the doors before the year is out. <laughs> Alice, I hardly think so. Really, the thought, the Reverend Cowley and his very wise sayings, Mr. Horton and his very loud voice, Dan and his droopy moustache, the bear symbol are. <laughs> Dear, are you done? I'll go and fix it upon the door. Well, it might not bring the good fellows in, but it should keep the bad ones out. Ah, that's themselves you're talking about. But mortal men, that's a different matter. But there is a way of finding out, if you really want to know who's for you. And you'll tell me, no doubt. But if it involves snails or salt cellars, then I shall leave you to it. But don't stay up to me.
in the deck, you'll be wanting to rise early to wash your face in the morning dew. There's wonders for the complexion, I believe. Deed, there's nothing wrong with my face that soap and water won't cure. <laughs> nothing wrong at all. <clears throat> good night, Alice. I'll leave you good night. All will be well now. I'm sure of that. All will be well. little lights are dying down on the hill. The sun is going to come up and the smoke will drift off the sea. The winter is nearly past and with it its cruelties, its cold, burnt away into a stubble. And its secrets too are lost and the strange impulses of the heart. To what will we awake? The flowers spring up where waiting ground lies empty. They will. They must.